I do not consider my life worth anything to myself, so that I may finish my task in the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the good news of God's grace, His kingdom grace. Look up and see that the fields are already white for harvest. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were bewildered and helpless. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest-ready fields. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Good evening and welcome, and we're very grateful that you were able to join us tonight and looking forward to a great conference this year. I'm Tracy with Kingdom of God Ministry and Missions, and that's kogmissions.com, and this is our sixth annual KOG Missions Conference. The first two were live down in Tennessee, and the last ones have all been online, and it's just been really great. We're able to bring in speakers from all over the world, and we're really looking forward to that. You can find the speakers and uh, links and times to everything here on kogmissions.com. And it will be forward slash online 2023. And if you scroll down, you can click the links to take you over to each of the sessions. And once the uh, conference is over and I have time to edit and get things cut apart under each speaker, there will be a link to their personal presentation that you can come back and watch them over again. So tonight we have Sir Anthony Buzzard on and then Claire McNull. I'm really looking forward to what they both have to say. Anthony has a presentation paper here. You can click it, the PDF, and follow along or print it out. Tomorrow evening we have Pastor Dan Gill, Shelley Ward, and Dr. Joe Martin, he's going to be sharing about their recent trip over to Africa and look forward to a great night tomorrow night. Um, tomorrow we have a special guest. Um, can't really say a whole lot online, um, but same special guest as last year. You can come on in the morning and he'll be sharing some. And then we have David from India and Carla, really looking forward to what they all have to share with us. And then on Saturday, we have three sessions. Um, so we have that morning session and we have an afternoon one. We'll be having a panel with Pastor Rob and Todd and Carlos and Laureen. I'm really looking forward to that. And then we'll be hearing from Robin about the Scattered Brethren, uh, Ken Laprad, and then Haroon will be speaking to us as well and sharing about the work in Pakistan. And then the final one, Diana from Holland is going to be sharing uh, stories from Jehovah's Witnesses exiting and why, why they were exiting. And then our very beloved Carlos will be sharing about the millennial reign, the first stage of the kingdom. Very exciting. 
and we'll just be winding it up with finishing this task. And so if you jump over to the home page, you can also find a link to get over to that page right here. And if you scroll down, you can find a lot of good information. Uh, tonight, Anthony will be sharing, and I just wanted to share you, show with you here uh, the Bible lessons that we did a year or so ago. Uh, it was really fun and a very good resource here. We hear about accepting Jesus. You can come listen uh, to that. And then all these basic Bible doctrines. You can use these for classes or just your own study. It's a really great resource. And going through just those basic Bible doctrines. So thank you for joining us live, those of you who have. And remember that during the conference, feel free to put questions or encouragement to our speakers in the chat. Your participation is always welcomed and appreciated. If you haven't already, please give our channel on YouTube a like. Um, you can hit the little bell so that you don't miss out on any uh, new upcoming videos or live streams. You can find us at the at symbol, KOG Missions, if you want an easy way to find us. And uh, please do share with other people as well. Saturday, we're going to be doing a drawing for this mug here, the Shema. And on the back, it has our mission conference theme this year. And then also, we're going to be doing a drawing for this tumbler. Uh, another Shema there, and on the back it lists out the hero Israel, and it has the verses on there that are in the Old Testament and that Jesus quoted himself, since it was a very important, first important commandment, as he said. So this year's conference is titled, Finish the Task. It's taken from Acts 2, or 20, 24 through 25. And this passage has been very important in my own life. And I know um, just from the lives of the people that are speaking this weekend, um, it really fits with them too and their commitment to uh, serving and uh, the kingdom work that they do. The verse says, I do not consider my life worth anything to myself so that I may finish the task, my task, and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the good news of God's grace. And we know if we listen to Jesus, I do believe that's God's kingdom grace. And that's really what we have to look forward to. And we have all been given the task and the ministry, not just missionaries or evangelists or pastors and teachers. And it's teamwork that helps us to get this task done. And the task is, as Anthony will be sharing a little bit later, what is the task? But it is spreading Jesus's teachings, all of them, not leaving out half of them, and our hope of the coming kingdom. That is what Jesus' purpose was, and it should be ours as well. And in this year's conference, we are going to see a variety of tasks that have been given to many different people. It's not just missionaries going off to some other country like Joel over in Africa. That is one task. But we have also other people that have been given tasks in their own life, whether it's because they've left uh, a religious organization or just things that have happened in their life. And so we all have a task. We just need to ask God what it is and be open to serving. And many times because of our background, God gives us a task because we are told that if we suffered or we experienced things, that we in turn then can minister to those people. And Jesus is coming very soon. We need to stay busy. And as John 4.35 tells us, we need to look up and see that the fields are already white for harvest. They are, and we need to be busy uh, spreading that kingdom seed. Tonight, Anthony is going to be opening our conference, and then Claire McNull, an ex-psychic, will be speaking after him. Anthony will be talking about finishing the task, strong and without compromise, and he will be defining what that task is, because if we have a task to do, we need to know what it is in order to do it. And I am very blessed to partner with Anthony and the rest of the, fellow, the, rest of the Restoration Fellowship team in getting that message of the coming kingdom out to people, the human Messiah, Jesus, and of course, his father, the one true God, 
and just putting that out on the internet and getting it out to people around the world so that they can find that and uh, hopefully find us. And we really enjoy connecting like-minded believers. If you go to my uh, web page that I had sh was showing before, there is a connect with like-minded believers and you can fill that out and it will put you in touch with me and I'll share with you. You can let me know where you're from and if we have anybody over in your area. So we'd like to help. And I know Robin Todd has uh, the Scattered Bread Brethren and you can go to his website as well and find that out. We'll hear more about that on Saturday as well. Uh, in regard to Anthony tonight, I appreciate that he's a great example of that Acts 20 verse. He has not compromised the truth. He continues to work and finish that task that he has been given. And as I say often, one never retires or they shouldn't retire from a calling or ministry if that's what God gave us to do. And we must get that full gospel out to the nations, not just one part of it, and we must do it faithfully and without compromise. So Anthony, welcome. Thank you, Tracy, for that generous uh, introduction. Well, it's a pleasure having you on as always. And I'm just really grateful for the work that you do and your enthusiasm and your enthusiasm for the kingdom. You've been doing this for a long time and you just never yes. seem bored talking about it. No, I'm not. I don't know of anything more interesting than that, as we'll get into in a moment. For that passion and for not compromising. And uh, we look forward to what you share. have to share tonight. I will be bringing up your presentation here and yes. if people want to follow along, they can do that and um, print it out as well from the website mm -hmm. if they uh, would like. And so let's see here. Uh, I think that is good, yes, good for you. You can see that. So I, I am going it. to jump off and I am going to let you share with us about uh, finishing the task. All right. Thank you so much, Tracy. The title, as you gave it to us, finishing the task. And the verses that I'm giving to you are verses that you're going to have to use, believe me, in persuading other people about the faith. In order to finish the task I start, it is essential that we first define the task precisely because of the massive popular confusion over what the Christian gospel is. The gospel about the kingdom of God is based on many key verses. One of them, Acts 8, 12. That verse is, in my opinion, a brilliant summary text showing what it is that we must believe in order to be saved. Not, I add, in order to make us appear intellectual or smart. No, no, not that. But in order to be saved, that is, how to gain indestructible life, or attain to the life of the age to come, poorly translated in many versions as eternal life, which is a bit vague. How can you believe the gospel as Mark chapter 1, verse 1, 14 and 15, and Mark 4, 13 say we must, if you cannot define it? Along with that critically essential text, Acts 8, 12, for defining the gospel, goes Luke 8.12. Easy to remember, Acts 8.12, Luke 8.12. I remind you of the parable of the sower, which Jesus said was the one parable essential for understanding all of the parables. Find that in Mark 4.13. Luke 8.12 goes as follows. Whenever, whenever anyone hears the message about the kingdom, as in the parallel in Matthew 13, 19. Now catch this, the devil comes and snatches away that gospel of the kingdom, that is, which has been sown in his or her heart or mind with this result, namely, so that a person will be unable to believe that gospel of the kingdom of God and thus be saved. So the devil knows what he's doing but the public often does not. The words I just quoted are the words of Jesus, the master teacher. It is hard for me to understand how any verse could be more brilliantly significant than that statement from our master rabbi. 
It's for a very good reason that the teaching of Jesus is repeated often verbatim in the first three gospel narratives. It is to me a staggeringly interesting fact that Jesus fully understood that without the gospel message of the kingdom, no salvation is possible. This is so very different from the popular idea that the gospel is complete and sufficient if we simply believe that Jesus died and rose again. And I allude here to the famous slogan of Billy Graham, nothing against, nothing against him personally, of course, but he said, Jesus came to do three days work, to die, to be buried, and to rise again. That popular but very much mistaken and truncated definition of the gospel is ubiquitous on the internet. Here's where you can help stimulate the right conversation. Thousands of sites on the internet are very much ready to offer answers to the public's questions. Ask them to define the gospel. And with almost unanimous response, they will quote the words of Paul and twist them, but not the words of Jesus. This is a very serious error. It gets rid of Jesus as the master gospel preacher. Note Hebrews 3.2, which you want to ponder very much. The saving gospel that Hebrews 3.2 says had its beginning with Jesus preaching. And this needs to be corrected, especially by those of us who've been privileged to understand that the gospel has a specific label, namely the kingdom of God, which refers firstly and predominantly to the future kingdom of God on the earth to be initiated when God sends Jesus back at his future parousia. I'm using the Greek word for the second coming there, using the modern Greek pronunciation because our Greek friends like that. So far, I think, people have not effectively used the internet marketplace to make our point about defining the gospel of salvation correctly. Don't forget another trick of the devil. The several translations do not want you to know that Jesus preached the gospel. They say that Jesus preached the good news, but Paul preached the gospel. Clever and deceptive. So I begin by calling your attention to Luke's remarkable record of the parable of the sower. It's in the 8th verse of Luke 8, easy to remember because 888 8, 8 happens to be the numerical value of Jesus. Luke 8, 8. That Jesus uttered these staggering words. Luke recorded that Jesus, having uttered the parable of the sower, customarily, not just once, but repeatedly, each time he taught the parable of the sower, he used to raise his voice or shout for special emphasis. This deliberate emphasis was designed by Jesus to call attention to the fact that without an understanding of the gospel about the kingdom, no salvation is possible. That reminds me immediately also of the words of Jesus in Luke 13, 23, where somebody in the audience asked Jesus this fascinating question. Will only a few people be saved? Jesus' answer in Luke 18, 8 is brutally true. He wondered whether when he came back in the future at his second coming, he would in fact find the faith at all on the earth. This leads to an equally fascinating discussion by Jesus as to why that dismal and threatening state of affairs could be possibly, could possibly be. Jesus then explained that it would be the multitude, the many, the majority, and not the exceptional few, who would suffer this shattering disappointment. Jesus said, and I quote, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves being barred from it, there will, of course, be a massive disappointment, Luke 18, 28. Those excluded from that future kingdom and the messianic banquet, which will introduce the millennium, will protest that Jesus had taught in their streets even that they'd performed miracles in his name as deceived but claiming to be Christian, only to find out that Jesus 
had never recognized them as true believers. Here's the text, Matthew 7, 22. In that future day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, Kyrie, Kyrie, in the Greek there, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name expel demons, in your name perform many miracles? Or in the BBE version, a great number will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, were we not prophets in your name? Did we not by your name send out evil spirits? By your name do works of power? And then in Matthew 7, 23, I, Jesus, will declare to these people, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So the reality and possibility of being deceived on the issue of salvation is dramatically taught by Jesus here. The point being made by Rabbi Jesus was that the road to the kingdom was very narrow and consequently very few, certainly not the majority, would successfully find it. This statement, it seems to me, is so unlike the popular evangelical concept that all one has to do is to recite the sinner's prayer or ask Jesus into your heart, a statement so vague as to be almost unintelligible. In the parable of the sower, the basis for understanding all parables, as Jesus said, 75%, that's to say three quarters of those who heard Jesus give the words of that saving parable, that is, they were exposed to the saving gospel truth, would fail to enter the kingdom. They would turn out to have been deceived. Jesus explained that, quote, some people believe for a while and then fail by falling away, Luke 8, 13. How diametrically opposite this is to the popular myth of once saved, always saved. And Paul, of course, agreed when he said that if one does not persist to the end, one will be cut off, Romans eleven twenty two. So salvation in scripture is in three tenses of the verb, past, present, and mainly future. No one wins the race when the starting gun goes off. Only when one crosses the finishing line, which is the future arrival of Jesus to rule the world with the saints, those are the verses, Daniel 7, verses 18, 22, 27. You're going to use them all the time. All people, it says, will serve and obey the saints, properly translated there. Now that we have defined the gospel biblically, the task we are assigned is indeed to preach this that's to say, well known to the Bible writers, this gospel about the kingdom in all the world, Matthew 24, 14. Those are the words of Jesus. And it's not only information about his work, i.e. his death and resurrection, but his words. There's a, an easy memory device there, not only about his work dying and rising, which is very important, but also his words. Firstly, about the kingdom coming. It seems to me that the internet is today's marketplace and we must make our presence known there. I recently asked the Billy Graham Association to define the gospel and I found them apparently keen to know what the kingdom of God has to do with the gospel. Our style of dialogue, of course, should always be conciliatory and non-critical. We should point out that the words John 6, 63 of Jesus are indispensable for our salvation, not only his atoning death and resurrection. Now, the public has been told by some dispensationalists, so-called, that the gospel of the kingdom is only for Jews. A greater error than that is hardly imaginable and is refuted at once by Acts 28, verses 23, 30, and 31, where Paul, and I quote, welcomed the people and began preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And note this, Paul was faithfully copying Jesus, who in Luke 9, 11, guess what? Welcomed the people and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazingly interesting? When some Jews refused to believe Paul, he left them with these words ringing in their ears. Paul said this, this salvation 
of God, about the kingdom of God, has been sent now to the Gentiles, and they, at least some of them, will listen to it. Acts 28, 28. Note that the activity of Paul as a tireless preacher of the gospel of the kingdom, copying Jesus, is the final word of Luke at the end of his second volume, the book of Acts. Yet that phrase, gospel of the kingdom, is very oddly absent from public discourse about how to be saved. Now, currently, some Unitarians have abandoned the glorious and ultimate climax to the kingdom gospel plan, namely the millennium, which will mark the end of the devil's current all-pervasive deceptive work. I make the point very simply for you. Revelation 12.9 informs us that, that, that currently the devil is deceiving the entire world. That point is repeated in 1 John 5.19. John wrote his letters to prevent the very real threat from those who are trying to deceive you. 1 John 2, verse 26, chapter 3, verse 7. I stress this fact then. When the millennium arrives at the future second coming or parousia of Jesus, the devil is going to be arrested by a powerful angel bound and locked up in an underground abyss so that, as we read, he can no longer deceive the nations. Revelation 20, verse 3. It's a matter of simple logic. The devil cannot possibly now be deceiving the entire world and at the same time be unable to deceive the whole world. To imagine, as so-called our millennialism proposes, that the devil has already been bound is to fall for a huge falsehood and is indeed to play fast and loose with the simple words of scripture. It is really one of the devil's greatest lies. It also interferes with the straightforward prophecy of Revelation 20. John added a further warning. But anyone tampering with his words in the book of Revelation, either by subtracting from them or adding to them, will receive a dreadful curse. You'll find that in Revelation 22, 18 to 19. The millennial prophecy in Revelation 20 is the grand end point of the whole of Scripture. It's the reversal of the disaster which happened in Genesis when Adam and Eve failed in regard to their appointed destiny, the devil deceived them. Revelation 20, about the millennium, which mentions a thousand years six times there, is the happy ending of the whole Bible. So somebody who recently called it a sideshow, they used that word, the millennium is a sideshow, is very seriously misled. The people who will be privileged to rule and reign in the thousand years are those who have had their heads chopped off. A rare word in the Greek, completely unambiguous word, meaning beheaded. That's to say martyred people will be among those who will be rewarded for their faithful loyalty to the gospel of the kingdom by being privileged to rule as kings with Jesus for a thousand years. It is an egregious refusal to believe these words of scripture if one maintains that being beheaded points to one's personal conversion. It was that totally unwarranted so-called millennial view of Revelation 20, which called forth from the celebrated Henry Alford, some of the strongest and most rightly indignant reactions in all of Bible commentary. Henry Alford said that if one cannot understand the yet future period of 1,000 years, premillennialism, Alfred then said, there's an end of all meaning in language and scripture is wiped out as a definite testimony to anything. Note those words carefully. It is completely foreign to the Unitarian work of nearly 200 years to espouse so-called our millennialism. It deals a blow to the gospel about the kingdom of which Revelation 20 is the grand and glorious climax and the amazing resolution of human history in favor of God's triumph over the devil. Revelation 20 means the resolution 
of the human predicament described in Genesis. On no account, twist those words. Paul expresses alarm and concern about the very false notion that the saints are currently ruling the world with Christ. With a biting irony, Paul said to the Corinthians, and I quote, some of you are satisfied and wealthy already. You've become kings without us. Then Paul said, would to God that you really were ruling so that we might be ruling with you. That's to say in the future kingdom, 1 Corinthians 4, 8. This truth was central to Paul's gospel, learned from Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2, Paul had said in horror at the church's incompetence to settle disputes, he said these words, don't you know that the saints are going to administer the world? And if the world is going to be under your jurisdiction, that, of course, is the future millennial kingdom of God on earth to be established at the second coming. The amillennial error not only embraces the illusion that the devil has already been bound so he can no longer deceive the nations, Revelation 20, verse 3, it adds to that the illusory and fanciful idea that Christians are now currently ruling the world with Christ. Such a concept indicates a complete failure to grasp the economy and plan of God, by which only in the future, the parousia of Jesus, will the devil be imprisoned and confined. And his lying methods will then be completely banished from society. What kind of a day is that going to be? The devil will be put out of commission worldwide. So our millennialism wipes out that Christian hope. The glorious future day when the devil will be bound will be the day when the nations beat their tanks into tractors and their guns into garden tools. That's the day when the Sandhursts and the West Points of the present violent system will be viewed as curio museums. That's the day for which we pray as Jesus told us to pray. Can move that up for you now, please? As we pray as Jesus commanded us to pray, may your kingdom come. May your will, Father, be done on earth. It's an extraordinary insult to the gospel to suppose that the glorious freedom from Satan's deception has already occurred in the lives of the faithful. And they all have their personal millennium. That is just egregiously wrong. The kingdom of God gospel beautifully summarizes the grand kingdom plan of God from Genesis to Revelation. It was in the Garden of Eden that human beings fell prey to the enticing lies of the devil. Jesus Messiah well understood his task as God's true world ruler, as that of reversing that human catastrophe and restoring the Garden of Eden and the promised fruit of the tree. God had said, you remember, in Jeremiah 27, verse 5, I have made the earth and the people and animals on it, and I will give all of this, the entire earth, to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Jesus beautifully reflects that purpose when he promises the faithful with these words, Fear not, little flock, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 12, 32, or as we might say colloquially, your father is delighted to give you the kingdom and rulership over the world with Jesus. That grand and splendid goal became swamped by the false notion of immortal souls disappearing to heaven to strum harps in advance of the future resurrection and millennium. Our task, as Tracy rightly calls it, is to complete the commission to announce the gospel of the kingdom to all the nations, Matthew 24, 14, so that the end of the age, the parousia, may come. Woe to us if we fall short of that marvelous commission. Woe to us if we explain it all away into nonsense with so-called our millennialism, which is a denial of the goal of the gospel of the kingdom, a denial of the Christian hope and the promise to Abraham and his descendants, his seed, that they will inherit the world. 
What a marvelous statement that is, Romans 4.13. Consider this fact about human destiny and purpose. In Exodus 19, 5 to 6, the commission and career was given by God to Israel, the nation. They were to function as priests and kings for God. They were to set the standard of law and order for the world. That verse appears in 1 Peter 2, 9, where the international church of true believers received that status as kings and priests. The international church, as Paul said, are now the Israel of God. So we are then part of those marvelous promises made to original Israel. The Israel of God described by Paul in Galatians 6, 16. That royal priestly status is repeated several times in Revelation 2, verse 26, Revelation 5, verse 10, and then in the great millennial passage in Revelation 24 to 10. The true believers will successfully take on that promised career of Exodus 19.6. The saints will rule as kings and priests for a thousand years. There'll be no devil then to confuse and deceive. The promise is finally repeated in Revelation 22, which speaks of the new heaven and earth predicted by Peter as a day which is an age at the end of 2 Peter 3 there. And thereafter, they will reign forever and ever in Revelation 22 verse 5. So I hope that you who are listening to this presentation can grasp how devastating is the attempt to explain away the millennium. It's an attack on the saving gospel of the kingdom and its glorious climax. Now let me introduce you to a verse in Luke, which has been hiding in many of your translations. It was at the Last Supper, which commemorates not only the atoning death and resurrection of Jesus, it also serves as a shadow of the great future messianic banquet to be held when the kingdom arrives. Jesus speaks there of the new, otherwise known as the better or second covenant, which has replaced, I repeat, has replaced the old covenant. It's entirely appropriate for Jesus then to say to the apostles and to us, just as my father has covenanted so the Greek reads, to give me the kingdom. So I now covenant with you to give you the kingdom. And you will sit on thrones to administer the 12 tribes of Israel. Luke 22, 29 to 30. This is the Christian destiny. This is the central covenantal theme which holds the whole Bible together. It is indeed the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham and his seed or descendants that they would be heirs of the world, Romans 4.13. Inheritors, that is, with Jesus as co-inheritor of that future kingdom. It would be a tragedy to think of us allowing the Bible doctrine to slip through our fingers through a lack of attention and failure to love the truth, which, as Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, is a condition of being saved. I give you Paul's exact words, because they did not welcome a love for the truth in order to be saved. God gave them over to a spirit of delusion, which is the equivalent, as Paul said, of wickedness and loss of salvation. No wonder then that Jesus made his words and teachings the critical factor in salvation, which we dare not overlook. Jesus said in John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. It is understanding those words which imparts life and energy to us. Failure to grasp them is the road to death and disaster. The one major misunderstanding which afflicts much of modern evangelicalism is the notion that Jesus had to keep the law of Moses perfectly while still teaching the new covenant. Such a thing would be a logical impossibility. It is true, of course, that Jesus was born under the law of Moses, was circumcised on the eighth day. Equally true that he altered the law of Moses, though, in regard to divorce. Notice, altered the law of Moses in regard to divorce. 
He also said his disciples were not bound to follow the law in paying the temple tax. Jesus was also free on that occasion to pay the temple tax so that we don't offend them. Matthew 17, 27. Paul was equally free to carry out the physical circumcision to Timothy. And then he said, because of the Jews in that region. Acts 16, 3. Paul was also explicitly clear in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 that he himself, Paul was a Jew and a Christian, was not under the law of Moses in the letter. He attempts to avoid that truth in some commentary and even some Jewish Christian so-called translations are a testimony to human stubbornness to cling to the law of Moses in the letter which is, as Paul said, bondage rather than freedom. It is like Hagar, the servant, as you think from Sarah, our mother, who is free under the new covenant law of Messiah. We Christians of all nations are to be subject to the law of Messiah, the Torah of Messiah, not the Torah of Moses in the letter, which is bondage. For that, read the whole book of Galatians in one sitting and it will make a powerful effect in your minds, I think. So it's our duty to labor to free our colleagues, even some Unitarians, who have never understood with clarity that the law of Moses is not the same as the law of Messiah. This would be a significant part of the task to which we have committed ourselves in propagating the gospel of the kingdom. We remember too that Jesus said, that only when that task is complete will he come again, Matthew 24, 14 and following. We are living certainly in end time days. The words Gaza and Negev are found in the minor prophets of scripture. It's true that Israel, the nation, has been given a land, but it returned there in 1948 in unbelief and is not now the kingdom of God. It will not be the kingdom of God until Jesus, the Messiah, is seen to be sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, the city of the great king. The future so-called great tribulation will be a mighty wake up. We need to move up now, Tracy, please. Will be a mighty wake up call, there we have it, to the people of Israel. They once remember this now, the Jewish people killed their own Messiah and continue largely not to accept him by believing his gospel of the kingdom. Following that great future time of tribulation, time of, time of Jacob's trouble, as Jeremiah calls it in 30 verse 7, the Messiah will return in great glory to rule in the future millennium. He will rule with the saints and the faithful of all the ages. There will be no imagined, I add this, there will be no imagined pre-tribulation rapture. All of the saints, including Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets, will be caught up to meet the descending Messiah at his one spectacular, visible second coming. Luke 17, verses 23 to 24, tells us that the second coming will be like lightning flashing from east to west. It will be universal and visible everywhere. Many years ago, I inquired of the Salvation Army people as I went to teach French and German in the American school in London. I would ask them, what do you understand by the kingdom of God? The almost invariable reply was from a seriously mistaken mistranslation of the King James Version of Luke 17, 21. The kingdom of God is within you. It doesn't say that i.e. in your heart. The kingdom of God is not in your heart, not within you. It's falsely translated. This is, of course, as we now know, a horrible mistranslation. What Jesus, in fact, said there is that the kingdom of God, when it comes in the future, will not be local or out in the wilderness and so on. It will be all over like lightning flashing from east to west. So then, that kingdom remains, remains the ultimate destiny of us as followers of Messiah. To ensure entry by the narrow road, we must 
struggle to enter, as Jesus said. We must throw off all Laodicean tendencies and muddles over eschatology in the millennium. We should be alarmed at the blindness of John Calvin, who when confronted with Acts 1.6, Calvin said of the disciples' question there, they had asked, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Calvin said there are as many errors in that question as words. This shows that Calvin did not understand the gospel of the kingdom any more than Augustine, who likewise confused the church and the kingdom, only to use Paul's words, a passion for the truth in order to be saved, 2 Thessalonians 2.10, will drive us to correct these catastrophic misunderstandings. Narrow indeed, as Jesus said, is the way that leads to the kingdom. And I quote again, it is through much tribulation that we must expect to enter the kingdom, Matthew 7, 14, Acts 14, 22. So let us encourage each other as we complete the task which God and Jesus have given us. Finally, I thoroughly recommend that you take time to read a book which conveys what I've attempted to pass on to you. That book is entitled The Gospel of the Kingdom. It was written by Wiley Jones in 1879. Its clarity on the millennium, on the future kingdom is admirable, as well as its support for the one gospel about the kingdom. Okay, Tracy, that's what I have tonight. All right. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. That was wonderful. We have some questions uh, for yeah. you. I have some questions for you. And if anybody in the audience has a question for Anthony, okay. um, please put it in all caps. It makes it easier for us yeah. to see. Mm -hmm. And you, um, let's see, you mentioned a lot of really good things. You were talking about defining the task. Uh, a lot of people talk about we need to preach the gospel, we need to preach Jesus. Um, yep. If what would you just say w without just saying preach mm. the kingdom? What would how what would you what does that mean preaching the kingdom? Well, it means that you start with the Old Testament. I'd rather call it Old Covenant scriptures because Paul in Romans one says the gospel of God is what the prophet said. That's the only Bible they had. The public has a very strange, twisted view of this. They think, oh, the old covenant, that's just for Jews. No, no, that's the basis of the gospel of the kingdom. If you want a verse in Isaiah 52, verse 7, you can look that up. It speaks of God reigning there, and it speaks of the good news, evangelizome is the Greek word. The gospel is the old covenant scriptures with additions, of course, and extra understanding in the new. The problem with the public is it hasn't done enough study. It is not involving itself in detail. And you're not going to do well unless you really engage these questions and become an expert. So the verses I've given you tonight are ones you're going to use all the time in explaining this to your friends. Uh, one correction that was brought up um, in the beginning of the paper it was Hebrews two th uh, was three two, but it's actually two three. So Thank I'm you. sure that Sarah will help get that corrected on there. Absolutely, let's we'll make it. I'm sorry about that. Hebrews it later, um, but yeah. just if you're making notes, yes, instead of three two, it's two three. Thank you. Um, Let me just check that. A most important verse that came to us with great power this year, fairly recently. Two, verse three. How shall we escape if we neglect and refuse to pay attention to such great salvation as is now offered to us, letting it drift past us forever? That's a poor translation. What that actually says there in the Greek, you look at it in another translation, probably NASB would do well. How shall we escape? This is a threat. We won't escape if we neglect so great a salvation which had its beginning in the teaching of Jesus. That is a marvelous refrigerator verse. Hebrews, as you correctly pointed out, 2, verse 3. We got that backwards. Sorry about that. Hebrews 2, 3. 
by no means miss that one and look at it in a, in a good literal translation there. Thank you. You're welcome. So you had mentioned, Anthony, uh, you know, defining the task. Could you please define for us, you mentioned amillennialism. What does that teach? What is amill? Yeah. People talk about that. Well, amillennialism literally means no millennium. Hmm. One Unitarian friend of ours said it was a sideshow. It's not a sideshow. They have not understood the gospel of the kingdom. The theory is that the millennium is a sort of personal thing, that when you get converted, you enter into a personal millennium. That is egregiously wrong. I don't have strong enough words to say how bad that is. Mm -hmm. Because the word beheaded, guess what that means? Beheaded. It's right. a rare word because only once in the New Testament, everybody, including your children of a young age, know that beheaded means you've had your head chopped off. To say that means your conversion is a very disrespectful and stupid, quite honestly, way of dealing with that very beautiful text. So this is the climax of the whole story from Genesis onward. Finally, you have a world where the devil isn't deceiving everybody. If that's not exciting, nothing's going to get you excited. So when you talk about the thousand years, you brought up Revelation 22 and a new heaven and new earth. So those are just two different times. We have the thousand years and then the white throne judgment. And then uh, the Revelation 22 about a new heavens and a new earth and the yep. holy city coming down and God. And th there are two totally different time frames. There's some dispute over that, Tracy. I'll mention this to you to think about. The bride appears for the first time in which chapter? 21. Well, I think there's two different uh, points about the bride. Sometimes it's referred to as the people, but the new Jerusalem is also referred to as the bride of Christ. It yes, seems. it's the bride of Christ. So, so Christ is going to have to wait a thousand years. I'm putting a little question over that. You we may have just one heaven, new earth, and just to repeat more of it. I know that's a bit radical, but our audience can think about that. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I tend to lean the other way that it's, yeah, it's a little bit later there because uh, we, we still see uh, sin and we have Satan rebelling and things yes. like that. And so it says where there's no more death and dying and pain, we still will have that during the yes. thousand years. Well, that's that exactly part of right. it, I don't think. Yes, that, that's right. In the earlier chapters in Revelation 2 and 3, you have the promises to the churches. Mm -hmm. Some of those promises are mentioned only in 21 and 22. So are we saying that those promises you have to wait a thousand years? Maybe not. It's a, an interesting question, but mm -hmm. I, I didn't mean to make a big deal out of that at all. Well, well, well main thing, Anthony, is you want to be there. So yeah, then we'll I find out. There. So how yeah. do you think all of this connects to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation? Oh, that's wonderful. They are the one church which did well. And the reason they did well was that they held to the testimony. The word testimony of God in the New Testament is a synonym for the gospel of the kingdom. They clung to the gospel of the kingdom. It's not just a vague word. The problem is that the public doesn't know the language of the Bible. I don't mean they don't know Greek and Hebrew. That's not the point. They don't know that when you say promise, you mean the promise to Abraham and his descendants that he would be heir of the world. You've got to help them to understand what these code words mean. Like the word is not just the Bible, it's the word about the kingdom very often. Mm -hmm. So that's what we teachers are trying to get over to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's see. So you'd mentioned about Israel and a lot of people I know talk about Israel has, you know, they've entered the land you mentioned in 19. Uh, 48 and a lot of people think that but they did return with unbelief and we look at the prophecy in the yes. Old Testament it, these are people who believed so this I, I believe it's setting up for all these end times events but I don't think it's that um, I'm, I'm agreeing you know, that with you entirely <laughs> absolutely because if you go to Israel you will not find Jesus sitting on the throne of David and if you've understood the gospel that would have to be true I'm thrilled that Israel has a land, and I'm thrilled to see Netanyahu speaking out and so on. But that's not, I repeat, not, not, not the kingdom of God. That will come when the Jews, a remnant of them, as Paul said, will finally get the point after a great tribulation, I think, in the future. 
So I'm glad that you raised that point. I'm agreeing with you entirely on that point, of course. What about um, now with everything going on over in Israel? Mm. Uh, it's an opportunity to share. I know the Jehovah's Witnesses are Absolutely. really good at about taking yeah. news and bringing yeah. that up to interact. Yeah. And uh, uh, Shelley mentioned that the Jehovah's Witnesses preach about the kingdom. Yes. Um, and, you know, we should be likewise doing that. What, what are your thoughts in regard to to sharing with with Jewish people? We get a lot of the Jews for Jesus, and yes. and whatnot, and they come out and become Trinitarians. I know, and that is a failure on our part. We the people that we really could could reach, especially in view of what's going on in the Middle East now, would be Jewish people and say, "Look, our Christianity agrees with you on the Shema." They say, "What? We never heard that before." So we have not made it easy for Muslims and Jews to understand the Bible at all because of the Trinitarian idea, which is three X's is one X. Oh, no, people say, no, three X's is one Y. In other words, three who's is one what. That puts <laughs> God into a what. God is not a thing. So right. we have to come right. very strongly against that idea. Yeah. Right, right. But what can we do? I mean, I know you have a lot of literature and people oh, yeah. could share it with people, but I do. what can we do to share with the, the Muslims and the, the Jews? And well, you can I, I don't know online. why that's not a bigger yeah. mission field for people of Abrahamic you know, faith. Yes. Well, you can get online at least for an hour a day and tackle one of the very, I mean, the best platforms are the big platforms like John MacArthur and other people, the Billy Graham Association, say, wait a minute, you don't sound like Jesus when you don't use the phrase gospel of the king. They'll find that easy, I mean, interesting. Mm -hmm. And some of them will change their minds. We're getting letters daily almost from people who say, wow, that's interesting. You mean Jesus believed in the Shema? And they can then relate to the Bible in a much better way. So you keep at it, but you must do something. You mm -hmm. must do something. You must have an audience. And I say that the internet is the contemporary uh, meeting place, isn't it, really? I, I agree. Like, Paul went to the, the city gates, and, yes. I, and I think, you know, God had the Roman roads put out so that this Absolutely. message could get out, and that's what the internet is. It's a blessing. And yes. speaking of the internet, our sister Jenny over in Australia, I got a message from her earlier today that half the country, the internet was shut down for really? quite a bit. And so... I, we need to be busy with what God has given us to do. We don't Absolutely. know when, you know, that might happen. Uh, do you think people can get sidetracked with busyness or things that oh, totally. or, you know, like you're doing a good thing. It's not yes. bad, but if we're not doing what Jesus told us to do, are we just treading water and not really getting anywhere? Treading water is not going to get you into the kingdom. That's the Laodicean threat. And also the passages in Luke that I alluded to where the multitude, the many, the majority in the parable of the sower failed. Mm -hmm. They didn't ask Jesus into their heart or accept the Lord, whatever that's supposed to mean. That's the whole point of what I understand the people of this persuasion that, that you and I share. Mm -hmm. They define the gospel. So you start there and the scope is absolutely unlimited on the Internet. A Your of definition people... of the gospel and yes. the task that we have is what? The definition of the gospel is it's the gospel according to what Mark chapter 1 says. Note the beginning. There used to be a, a very nice program on British radio where the, the opening speaker would say, are you ready? Are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Mm -hmm. And the children got the point. The beginning of the gospel, also the one that you rightly corrected, the 2-3 two, 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 of Hebrews. Hebrews 2-3 is marvelous. Watch out. Woe to you, you are in danger of losing your salvation if you don't pay attention to the gospel, which had its beginning, the Greek says there. Because most people think Jesus was simply preaching the gospel of Moses. That is fundamentally wrong. The confusion in the public mind is much worse, I think, than most people imagine. We're trying to do our little bit to correct that. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Anthony. And uh, Nancy says thank you. She always enjoys <laughs> listening to you. She's and very generous. She's very I know kind. that uh, I'm pretty sure <laughs> everybody on tonight would have the same thing Good. to say. I know I don't get bored. Just like <laughs> I, when I was in class with you, it was always interesting. I didn't fall asleep. 
and uh, it's exciting I and, I, and i think we we do we need yes. to be busy with what jesus gave oh, us yes. what as you say what better thing is there to do and i don't know we're talking about living forever and ever and ever and ever and let me just add to your sentence there tracy i can remember visibly and and quite definitely your face in the front row of the college class there on the kingdom <laughs> and you were delighted with this gospel of the kingdom you don't well, remember it's that, our hope. I, i'll never it's forget exciting. It. and i think that's what we need to be encouraging our young people with it Absolutely. gives them something to do i think unfortunately many people and especially young people they don't have a purpose in life there it's not exciting it's you know what is there to do and i think this kingdom message is exciting and um Absolutely. yeah meg has a good idea print pamphlets of the kingdom message and leave a few at laundry mats or other places because you never know yeah. who will read them we do it all the time i carry kingdom books with me mm -hmm. and i get any hint of interest i give them a book immediately i promise them i'm not coming after your money you're not going to hear from me again i'm not going to beg you for tithe or anything like that but you might be interested, have you ever thought I say to them, Jesus said, blessed are the meek, they're going to go to heaven. Uh oh, didn't say that. Blessed are the meek, they're going to inherit the land promised to Abraham. Wow, I didn't learn a word of that in the Church of England. Mm -hmm. They didn't know it. it did, the clergy didn't know that. They hadn't learned it in school. So we're trying wow. to make up for that. <laughs> well, I agree with Lorraine here. We love our Anthony and... Uh... <laughs> Shelley says that you rock, Anthony. <laughs> Whatever that means. That's modern language. I don't know. I don't probably fully understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, what, what is the instrument you have? Maybe you're not playing. I'm an oboist. Yes. If somebody yeah. wants to get a, a free copy of my oboe CD, I know CDs are out, out of fashion these days, but it's actually not bad. I, I quite enjoy it. When I'm feeling ruffled, I play my own music to myself and it settles the brain. So you can get a copy of that from me if you just ask for it. it Cost nothing. Well, that sounds great, Anthony. <laughs> yep. Well, Good. thank you again. Any last words? Last words are Luke 4.43. Mm. Jesus said, I am duty bound. I'm compelled by God to preach the gospel about the kingdom. That's why God sent me. Hallelujah. Luke mm -hmm. 4.43. If you don't know Luke 4.43, you should say to yourself, I haven't got started yet. Mm -hmm. When you get Luke 4.43 under your skin, if that's the right expression, then you're finding out what Christianity is all about. If your heart is not broken, I'll finish with this, Tracy. If your heart is not broken by the destruction you see on the news, it's very, very awful to watch children being beheaded, houses beautifully built being shattered. If you're not crying out to God, may your kingdom come, which comes from 1 Chronicles 29, that's where Jesus got the Lord's Prayer from, then your heart needs to be stirred and moved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks and you can reach out to Anthony here at Anthony Buzzard at, Mindst yeah. at Mindspring.com. Mindspring mm -hmm. Thank so, you. Thank you, Anthony, thank you. and have a blessed evening. Thank you, Tracy, for allowing me to be part of your... It's always a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Good night. Good night. So that was a great start to our conference and really looking forward to our next speaker, who is Claire McNull. And I'm going to uh, bring up uh, kogmissions.com here with the occult in the church. Claire and I have done numerous videos already, and we're hopefully going to be doing some more. And one will be on uh the cult and uh, Catholicism coming up maybe in November, we'll see. But all of the videos that we've done are on this page here. If you scroll down, you can um, watch uh, the different, her testimony here. Um, and we had a discussion after like an interview. And then we had a series, Sorcery and uh, the New Age Infiltration, Sorcery and the Occult in the Church. And it's the first uh, video here in this series. And there were four of them, I believe. And we also, you can click this to take you over to Claire's website. And I'll pull that up here in a, in a second. Um, but these were all very interesting and very good videos. Um, you can watch them in a group and maybe have a discussion or just yourself take notes check it out yourself to see um as claire will share she knows what she's talking about this isn't just uh, coming off the top of her head um but 
you can uh, go check out her website. We'll bring that up here. Let's see. There we go. And, um, whoops, wrong thing. That's her presentation. Okay, let's see. I clicked the wrong button. I guess let me have my mistake for the night. And here we go. So Clairvoyance to Christ. She has a blog you can check out here and a list of New Age practices. Um, actually, it would help if I brought it up on screen. Um, there we go. And uh, you can scroll down and take a look at these practices. Check them out. You can click and get more information on them. You can check out her blog here. Uh, she has some very interesting uh, things on yoga and other things. People think that that is uh, no big deal. It's just stretching. Um, but if you watch the videos that we did, you'll find out that um, it, it isn't. And so um, we did do straight talk about Halloween. She has her article here. And I don't think I have that video put up. Maybe I do on the web page yet. I'll have to check that. I've been busy lately. But um Check out her website here. I'll put that in the chat so that you can click right over to there. And let's see. So um, talking about Claire. Claire is a former practitioner of the occult, and she was involved in it for many years and also a professional psychic. Uh, God's timing is amazing, and it's been a real blessing to have her as a sister in Christ and as a friend and uh, Claire and I, as I mentioned, did those, the, those series. That's something that's been very heavy on my heart when I see in the church and young people getting so involved in these things. And they just think it's fun and games, which was the title of one of our videos. But it isn't. And we really need to be aware of this. And so I encourage you again to take a look at those videos and pay attention tonight uh, on what Claire is going to be uh, talking about. When she came out of the occult, she felt there was a need to minister to those that were still in the occult, um, also to brothers and sisters that have experienced some sort of occult activity in their past. And as tonight we're going to hear, she's also been given the task of warning the church. And she's going to talk about some things that, you know, maybe we haven't thought about uh, in the, the occult in the church and, and what the church does. Um, after she left the occult, she didn't realize right away that there was so much deception in the church. And I just really rejoiced that when she heard God's voice and uh, when Jesus reached out to her, I think we could say, um, and to follow him, uh, she did. And she followed him to truth. It was a little bit of a process, but I just rejoiced that uh, she is where she is today and uh, I look forward to hearing what she has to share with us tonight. So, Claire, welcome. Hello, Tracy. Thank Good you. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening to you, too. Well, thank you for joining us. And um, I look forward to hearing what you have to share with us tonight. And okay. I will let you um, share a little bit about yourself briefly in case people maybe don't know you and then if you would like to get into um, your presentation i'll pull that up then absolutely and actually i'm i am going to share a, a bit about myself in my presentation okay. as well, well should I so pull the it up? That, yeah the way that i've set it up um but yes uh, you have filled in beautifully uh, a very brief explanation about who i am and what i was up to and um, I was in, heavily involved in what is known as the New Age movement that is basically sweeping the globe and actually has been. We're going to go into the history here tonight okay. quite some time. Um, and uh, yeah, I spent 27 years doing, being involved in that, eight years earning uh, a living doing that. And mm. so... Uh, it's very important to me, and I believe very strongly that God has taken that and is taking that so that I can help educate and inform others because it's sneaky and it's evil and it's deceptive and it is uh, making its way and has been 
for quite, again, for quite some time into our church, into our Christian church. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. And I will uh, bring up your, um, my presentation presentation <laughs> here. Yes. Uh, and great. I will let you have a go. Thanks so much and look forward to what you have to share. Okay, thank you very much, Tracy, for that nice introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, I've got a little talk here that I'd, I'd like to expand on tonight. Um, I am calling it Love, Light, and Lies, Discerning New Age Occult Practices in the Church. And this is just a little how-to for believers. So, excuse me, I seem to have gotten a bit of an itchy nose here. Um, I know that there are probably some of you have heard a number of my talks before. We're going to go in a little different direction. It's all the same topic, but I am going to answer four questions tonight. They are, what is the New Age movement? Um, what could possibly be its purpose and its practices? I'm going to talk about who I am and why I am qualified uh, to speak about the New Age. Um, how can Christians discern what is new age and how do we do battle with the new age in our churches? So question number one, what is the new age movement? What are its practices, its purpose? Well, the new age movement has been for some time and currently is in even a greater way, a worldwide network of, um, of groups in every country and every place literally on the planet with tens of thousands and likely at this point in time, many, many more than that number participating in it as organizations. There is this basis of uni unity in diversity um, and this is all meant to usher in what we are hearing and understand in terms of the world and the way the world is speaking right now, the new world order. So there may be people who don't get that there's actually a connection between the things that you are seeing in the news right now and the directions in which the world is being uh, moved with this collective effort um, towards what is spoken of uh, or termed a new world order. So the new age movement is very much an integral tool and a part of that. The new age movement operates on the basis of esoteric or uh, uh, knowledge that is only for a few very higher people and also occult teachings. Um, it also involves extensive political collusion and agreement amongst uh, the leaders of the movement, again, which at this point are, are many and all over the wor world. And furthermore, what is it? It is a movement that has successfully infiltrated every aspect of our lives, personal, professional, and religious. So the New Age movement includes uh, organizations in its, its worldwide network that teach things like mind control, holistic health, um, so even the natural foods and the health food, food uh, fads that were started to become big in the 60s and the 70s, those are all hooked in literally with the New Age movement. Esoteric philosophy, science, and politics. It also involves um, organizations that are dedicated to peace and goodwill. So you probably can call to mind a number of names of those sorts of organizations. Greenpeace would be one such organization. It's also involved in consumerism, uh, environmental uh, and nutritional uh, organizations and religious cults. So the New Age movement, the backbone of the New Age movement is Eastern mysticism and ancient occult practices. So we see those in scripture going back to Babylon. 
Uh, Eastern mysticism involves um, countries like India and China uh, and things like Buddhism and Hinduism. This is the backbone of the New Age movement. Um, also, it hinges around and very much um, pushes this notion of mystical experiences being very, very high, um, high level and very important and very sought after. Um, experiential religion, um, so basically meaning that re uh, religions that uh, have an emphasis on experience of the mystical and direct experience with psychic phenomenon. Now, uh, the what would be termed psychotechnologies, a pretty big word, um, uh, to induce altered states of consciousness that are involved in these mystical experiences and these um, direct experiences of psychic phenomenon. These include medita meditation and, and psychedelic drugs, and so an example of that, as I've put here, would be something like LSD. Probably most people would be familiar at least with the idea of that. And many more techniques and approaches that I'll be uh, talking more about as we go forward that promise to induce transformation, which is a euphemism for progressively deeper levels of demonic influence. And I'm going to demonstrate that in this talk or address that in this talk. There's also this uh, belief, this hinging on this underlying foundational idea that God is a force to be manipulated and humans can become their own gods. This is a goal of this movement and come to a place where they can attain godhood. So we can see that this is not compatible with our beliefs in our God, our Father, and as followers of Jesus Christ. Now, the New Age movement, I'm going to dig into a little uh, bit of a history here. It, it actually is something that's been uh, not always termed, of course, the New Age movement, but um, it's been going on and on and coming on for thousands of years, basically. It got its start, its modern start. And by that, I mean um, the way that we see it today. This started back in 1875, and it was spearheaded by a woman named Helena Blavatsky. And she created a society that was known as the Theosophical Society. And many, many uh, well-known people of the day, um, including like a gentleman like Thomas Edison, the, I think the inventor of the light bulb, um, high-level uh, philosophers and authors. Um, I cannot remember. Nate Nathaniel Hawthorne, I believe, was a part of this organization. Um, they got together. And Helena Blavatsky was uh, in contact, as she explains it, with highly evolved spirit beings. And there was also this attitude, and continues to this day, this attitude that everything else outside of them and this higher level uh, uh, connection with these spirit beings is basically common herd mentality. They also uh, worked with telepathy uh, and their inspiration, they believed, was drawn from spirits, uh, and which are demons in, to us. We, we know that that's who they are. And elementals, which are um, plant spirits and, and so things on that plant level. Um, they believed that they were actually receiving transmissions and wisdoms from plants, demonic messengers, uh, and then what I'm terming here demonic or, or demon manipulated writing, which is known in uh, New Age practices as automatic writing. 
that's where somebody just goes goes uh, quiet, allows a demon literally to enter into them, and then begins to write, um, usually without even knowing what they're doing or what they're writing. The demon is writing through them. So she was recording the messages in this way. They were also utilizing secret signs and words that they could recognize to help keep the information that they were trying to disseminate amongst themselves from what they termed to be hostile investigators. And so they were pressing the belief that all world religions have basic truths that transcend any perceived or literal differences between them. They also exhibited extreme hostility towards Christians and had a strong desire uh, and purpose towards eliminating Christianity altogether. They held high wisdom of uh, wisdom traditions and things of India. India became a hub place for this theosophical society and their offshoot groups. They were pushing the theory of evolution, the um, idea of spirit guides, people opening up to spirit guides, and that it was a high level thing to achieve illumination and enlightenment. Now, Helena passed away and the torch was eventually passed on to a woman named Alice Bailey. And this woman labeled herself a Christian. She had been married and divorced um, of, an, of an Episcopalian pastor. Alice had a, an extreme hatred for Christianity. She uh, grew up in a Christian family and had other Christian relatives. And um, whatever her experiences were there were clearly not good ones, um, which can happen for people in uh, legalistic families. Um, Christian drawing on that sort of uh, way of looking at Christianity and taking it out into the world but she did develop a, a great hatred for Christianity and developed a great loyalty to the cause of occult practices and Eastern mysticism. So out of her um, devotion, she did a lot to continue to move the, the new age forward. She wrote uh, uh, dozens of books that had very specific instructions from what she termed the masters. These books too were written by automatic writing and uh, channeling cult techniques. We're gonna be talking more about that. Um, they espoused the divinity of man. Uh, they talked about uh, reincarnation. They took attacks on God's word and spread the lies of the serpent. She also developed um, arcane schools and organizations that were entirely devoted to plotting um, through networks the coming new age to have that established. And she also started a publishing company in 1922 and she called it Lucifer Publishing. But then a few years later, she changed the name to Lucis. And so my question is, was Lucifer, uh, the name Lucifer too obvious perhaps? Now this group of people and uh, her, her successors who again were many and were devoted, too many to go into detail here, worked quietly on the side. They stayed low, kept things quiet, kept a very low profile until 1975, when the whole new age could be publicly disseminated by all available media. And this was to um, start a long-term mass indoctrination of the world. So these instructions that they had received and that she had received um, were carefully, carefully being played out and brought into the forefront to be able to start an in, a program of indoctrination. And also mass indoctrination of children through the public school system. Okay. 
we all have questions <laughs> about the public school system and many of us for a long time. This helps us understand why those questions would be in our hearts and in our minds where our children are concerned and their educations. So if it were to have purpose and goals, um, the way that they would describe these were, would be to usher in a millennium of love and light. And that reminds me of 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen that Satan, it's no marvel, Satan disguises as an angel of light. Who doesn't want love and who doesn't want light? Also, again, to establish a one world order and uh, a new mandatory world religion that was also part of the plan to eliminate believers in Jesus Christ and destroy true Christianity by infiltrating the churches and to unite all world religions. So the heavy emphasis on, well, and the, the whole emphasis on ecumenism, but eventually rolling this over into a mandatory world religion. Um, but the ecumenism, ecumenism doesn't include uh, those people that worship our, our Lord God Almighty. And ultimately, bottom line, to take the world for Satan. And also uh, very key to their purpose and goals, and this is really the only way that they can bring this about, is to deceive millions and millions into supporting projects that are designed to eventually strip them of their civil liberties and much of their property, uh, believers their faith in Christ, or keep people away altogether, people who don't know Christ yet, who are seeking and searching, and just every day all over the world people, and um, to strip them of their everyday uh, lives. Um, so this is done through pulling at the heartstrings, pressing on love and light and unity and unity and diversity, and peace and love and, and um, charities that can help other people. It really, this is all part of this new age movement. Um, even, I just made a note here, sincere new age adherents, those who are maybe mildly interested to those like myself who deeply participated are not aware of how evil and how deep this goes. And that they are servants of Satan. I had no idea until God opened my eyes. Now, I want to strongly recommend that if you're looking for a book to read, this is a good one. For me, it's a must read for Christians. It is called The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, The New Age Movement, and Our Coming Age of Barbarism by author Constance Cumby. Now she wrote and published that book. The book was published in 1983. Um, the beauty about the book now is it's a great read 40 years after she wrote this book with the intention to expose the new age. It is an unbelievably well-researched book. I do not agree with everything that Constance has to say, um, but that's okay because she's got a main drive here that is very, very important. Um, she is also, she was, uh, I, she's, she's aged now and isn't practicing anymore, but I believe she was a lawyer and she gave up her lawyer career, um, took time off so she could actually research and put this uh, together, alarmed at what she was starting to uh, understand was going on and also a, a professing Christian as well. So that book in PDF format, you can download at my website, clairvoyance to christ.com slash dangers, but there is a link there on the main page. So now the interesting thing too about the New Age movement, although everything comes around and always ends up being the same thing, is that furthering its cause as well is this notion known as humanism, which is hugely popular in the world today and has been for some time. Now the focus of humanism uh, it is that the prime importance is attached to humans, the human rather than God. 
It involves self, 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 self validation, um, where we get to validate ourselves from our own impressions, our own feelings, self will. We're the drivers of our lives through our self will, self realization. We get to come and know so much about ourselves through our will, through our validation, through the projects and things that we take on. Terms like real self, true self, higher self are very much a part of, um, of uh, the teachings of humanism. It's all about expressing feelings. I say, I call it pathos over logos, emotion over logic, uh, emotion over the word. Uh, very much about celebrating bodies, all the different kinds of bodies. Um, which is wonderful. We all have great, wonderful, different bodies, but this is all about celebrating it, elevating it to something completely uh, off the map. And of course, now we know today too, it's about celebrating every possible uh, uh, gender, um, whatever. I mean, it, it, I can't even stay on top of all of that stuff, but I, you know, it's about the whole shebang, doesn't matter. It's all good and all to be celebrated. There, and it's so very important in humanism to be in one's own truth, which means basically that what's true for you might not be true for me, um, that truth is relative, it's malleable and fluid and not absolute. Again, in direct contravention, directly going against God the Father, God our creator, and his absolute truth. Then there are things like radiant self, discovering your radiant self, the, um, the center at the source of all consciousness. And there is absolutely no Jesus Christ. It's all antichrist and self. So a couple, one very important thing that is core to the New Age movement, it doesn't really matter what aspect of it that it is, it's learning how to calm and relax, to center um, yourself. Um, it's one of the most important processes of all the new age tools that are out there. So to do this, Eastern techniques are taught and used so a person can sit still and quiet long enough to concentrate on focusing her attention inward. It's about going inward, um, visualization, meditation techniques to help con uh, contact the source of all consciousness at their center. If you can see, this is all about going inside. It's all about self. It's about withdrawing uh, from everything, going inside, opening up the imagination, visualization through meditation techniques and what this eventually leads to is contacting and meeting one's own higher self, experience of one's own divinity and self glory. Well, what? let's just see what God has to say about that. Isaiah 14, 14, I will be like the most high. Ezekiel 28, 2. This says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am God, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not God, though you set your heart as the heart of God. That's what this is all about. Now, there was a pretty famous uh, New Ager back in the 70s, 80s time um, named John Randolph Price. And this is one of his quotes. He was very influential. This was one of his quotes. The truth of our being is that the higher self of each individual is the Christ. Oh boy. And he means all people. He is not just talking about or even talking at all about believers in Jesus Christ. He is talking about this thing known as the Christ consciousness 
that New Agers believe is available to every single human being. And when I was in the New Age, I knew other New Agers who channeled the Christ consciousness. It's just mind-blowing, super evil stuff. Okay, so hopefully that has helped give a foundation that we can step off now, learn a little bit more about me and my journey, um, and um, why I call this out and how we can do that. So who am I and why am I qualified to speak about the new age? Well, I was born into a family, lapsed Roman Catholic mother, Jehovah's Witness father, very odd combination. My grandmother was a devout Roman Catholic and she was the family matriarch. Um, I was baptized in a Roman Catholic church. We went to church every Sunday and pretty much for the thir first um, 18 years of my life, it was all about that, except my mother was pretty, um, she was vehement. She did not like it at all, but she acquiesced to my matriarchal grandmother. That meant I spent 13 years in Roman Catholic separate school attending mass, sometimes daily, um, confession, going through the sacraments, totally uh, having it drilled into me that the Pope was infallible. Um, no Bible was ever opened in school. All the information came from priests and catechisms and everything in between. So I realized when I had left high school that the Bible that I had been told I had to buy and I spent money on it had never been opened. The Bible that I had to have to be in my school, uh, my Roman Catholic high school had never been opened. Um, so at the end of high school, I left that all behind and I just stepped right off into the secular life and church and everything else like that. It was strictly with weddings and funerals. And that was that. Also as a child, I experienced a lot of supernatural phenomenon. I would have sleep paralysis, something called OBE precur precursors. There's this experience that can happen, a supernatural experience called an out-of-body experience. I would almost get there and then pull back. I saw, felt, and heard ghosts. And um, very prevalent for me was the seeing of visions, things I had nothing to do with creating. They would just happen to me. They would be in behind closed eyes. It happened all the time. Sometimes they were nice. Sometimes they were very scary. But the, for some reason, this was a, a normal thing for me uh, through my childhood. In grade four, there was a dabbling in my room, a Catholic high school with the Ouija board. And also grades four and five, I took elective class and it was yoga. So I started uh, uh, doing yoga at that age. I reconnected with yoga when I got into my 20s by taking a class that actually was being held uh, and taught in the Christian church down the street. Now, I wasn't at all involved with the Christian church. I just knew there was a yoga class down there. So I went down and I took it. This, put, this set me on a track to practicing yoga regularly, almost every day for, for a good number of years. And then in my late 20s, I met a woman who I would call my spiritual, my first spiritual mentor. There ended up being many. She was heavily involved with the new age and a cult. And she introduced me to angel cards and astrology, intuition, energy healing, numerology, tarot, psychic readings, past life regression, mediumship, palmistry, which is palm readings. You name it, she did it and introduced me to it. I got hooked. I started studying. I started taking courses and classes. I would go to readers, get my cards read, get my palm read. I'd go to places where there were demonstrations of this, that, and the other thing. Um, I studied astrology. I uh, sat with various New Age practitioners, and then I began doing um, tarot card readings, astrology, and psychic readings on my own. Now, in 1992, I had uh, taken a visit to a church known as a spiritualist church, and it's where conjuring of spirits of the dead are demonstrated. 
Coming home on the heels of that, I suffered a traumatic sp uh, spiritual attack. Uh, during that attack, the supernatural phenomenon that I experienced was demon spirits literally trying to get inside me at the base of my neck, demon spirits passing through me, um, demon spirits wrapping unseen arms around me. The temperature drops in my room were, uh, in my home and in my room were 20 degrees or more, and I was terrified I didn't think I was going to survive the night. To try and help me figure out what was going on, I sought guidance and answers. I needed help with this. But the problem was I went through uh, to seek answers from New Age practitioners. And of course, I was told that I had the gift of clairvoyance. That was what all those visions were about. That I also clearly had the ability to communicate with spirits. And that the best way to deal with this was to develop those gifts and to join the new age. Heavy, heavy time. Um, quite a bit quieter than today, but ever so cool. Like if you could get a foothold in that kind of practice in the new age, that was considered to be very cool. So I said no way to the spirit communication because I knew full well what was going on that night during that traumatic attack. And, um, I, but I continued with all the other practices. I continued with the clairvoyant readings and the psychic and the tarot and the astrology. And I did have intense supernatural attacks that continued at a rate of about six per year for the next, literally for the next 15 years. These would wake me up at night. They would keep me up for hours. They were very frightening. Um, and so basically in 2007, I did what I call, I gave in. I gave in to that realm and decided to begin to develop my spirit communication skills, something that I had pushed back for years and enter into mediumship development. I studied uh, all over North America. If there was a teacher I wanted to study under, I traveled to that place and I went and I would study with him or I would study with her. Um, much of my uh, development occurred in a demon-filled spiritualist, in demon-filled spiritualist churches. These churches where they conjure the spirits of the dead are demon-filled, and you feel it and know it and see it when you go into these places. And uh, also in a haunted demon village, um, demon-filled village in a place called Lilydale, New York. If you are interested in knowing anything more about that, simply uh, Google it and you'll find out about Lily Dale, New York. I spent a lot of time in that village. And in 2011, I dropped everything else. I had been running a retail business and other businesses, and I just went, okay, that's it. I'm full on. I began my full time career in the New Age as a clairvoyant, a psychic, doing mediumship readings, demonstrations, seances, haunted house clearings. I also did animal communication of both animals that are alive and animals that had passed on into the spirit realm. I was teaching, mentoring, blogging, podcasting, and writing books on the new age. And I spent eight years of my life earning my living this way. And then eventually, in the last few years, I added to that whole mix the regular use of plant, uh, plant medicines and um, psychedelics. Um, and did what, what are called plant medicine journeys. I also became involved and participated in shamanism and witchcraft. Um, one thing that is very important for people who are listening today to understand about anything, even the smallest thing uh, in the new age is that occult involvement always leaves you wanting to go deeper, wanting to do more, wanting more wisdom, wanting to find out more. It becomes an addiction. I'm going to take a sip. Okay. So again, central to every bit of occult training is the practice of meditation and visualization. And that involves everything, shamanism, witchcraft, doesn't matter, psychic, clairvoyant, mediumship, every single thing that you can think of. 
that's involved in occult training and occult, this is your central practice. This opens the door to clairvoyance, which is basically being able to see the future, see the past, precognition, um, predicting the future events, seeing into the spirit world. It's a non-local perception, which means um, clairvoyance can have you seeing something that's happening on the other side of the world because it doesn't matter where you are and seeing visions and spirits. This opens the door to the demonic realm. So I spent 27 years of my life as an active clairvoyant student, teacher, and practitioner of the New Age occult. I can easily say I have been there and I have done that. I know firsthand the dangers, the evil, and the eternal damage. And as I say that, I choke up that it does to those who will not forsake and repent. So I speak about it. So I just want to quickly um, let you know what my, my journey to Jesus was uh, like, give you my brief testimony there. In July 2018, after seven years of practice, I was overwhelmed with a very strong, what I call incomprehensible urge to read the Bible. And so it was so strong, um, I just, I did. I started to read. It was hard, but I kept pushing through. I was surrounded only by other New Age practitioners and people who were interested in the New Age. I did not know another Christian. I did not go to any church. My journey was a very solitary journey and it was, I was alone with scripture. I, it was just, okay, I, I'll do this. By September of that year, I was convicted that my, my clairvoyant uh, activities and my active participation uh, in the occult was not okay, that I, I could see, I could identify it from scripture as sin. It was clear to me. But the battle keeps raging in my life. Satan keeps what I would say, upping the ante to keep me from Jesus. I'm bombarded daily with signs and symbols and things, um, little things, little supernatural things, et cetera, that are meant to tempt me to come back to the devil and turn me away from Christ. January of 2019, in the middle of one night, I have one of my major spiritual nighttime attacks. Only this time, for the very first time, um, because I'm getting to know Jesus in scripture, I call on Jesus. My attack stops within seconds as opposed to the hours that it would usually last. So I'm feeling myself drawn more and more by God to come to Jesus. I'm starting to wind down my clairvoyant career. I'm so convicted I stop scheduling appointments. I discontinue my courses and my mentoring. Of course, as a result of this, my income drops away. And then Satan really ups the ante. Um, I am approached three times, offered big money to do a series of weekend seances for a producer from Hollywood. I have to be in that part of the world at that time. Um, and um, had some connections and somebody put this man in touch with me and he wanted me to do these seances. And I, I was also um, told that I would be part of the production that he was trying to develop out of this. And the amount of money that was being offered was ridiculous. And I knew I could not, I could not do it. And so I said, no. Then in March of 2019, I experienced another one of my severe nighttime attacks. Again, I immediately called out to Jesus for help. And again, it immediately ended. Um, after a period of wakefulness that night and listening to scripture, I came to faith in Jesus. Um, I called out to him over and over again. I was converted and I was baptized by the Holy Spirit. And um, now I knew I was a believer and I am following Jesus Christ. And the other very interesting thing about this experience, as well as a number of other things, including uh, worrisome and um, ever growing drug use, my clairvoyance was completely gone. These things completely fell away, never to, be, to come back after that night. 
So little journey into the wilderness, my faith was immediately tested uh, with nighttime supernatural experiences for about two weeks post my conversion. I called on Jesus, I was clear who I was following. I demonstrated that, talked to God, prayed. Once that passed, and praise God it did, I was completely free of the supernatural attacks that I had suffered for 27 years, never to have another one of these. I was, I, I am to this day um, blown away by that after having been tormented for so many years. My business was gone. I was only at a half income, which of course tested my marriage. After some serious testing on that, God allowed my marriage to stay intact. And he teaches, it teaches me and taught me through his word how to be a godly wife and submit to my own husband in order to show my honor for God um, my husband and I, our lives are blessed in so many ways. Um, my husband, he's not a believer, but he recognizes and reflects on this often. He sees the Holy Spirit. He sees the power of God at work in our lives. And he continues to see it at work in our lives. But at this point, I'm still not going to any church. I've only got a, the only uh, fellowship I've got is a long distance Christian woman friend. And I daily pray that God will lead me because I'm also aware that I need to have a water baptism, but I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And I pray for him to lead me to water baptism in his time and in his way. It's a remarkable story. I won't go into it tonight, but I was water baptized October 2019. And I'm absolutely certain that was the baptism that my father in heaven led me to. Um, I go down a lot of Christian deception. When you don't have fellowship, you start to watch YouTube. There was that. God always kept me in these places long enough to learn and then would lead me away. And I would just, it would end. And I would just move to the next learning experience. I learned so much, so many doctrinal deceptions without sticking in any of them for too long. Praise God. All the Calvinism, Lordship, Salvation, Osas, every kind of dispensationalism, Hebrew roots, false Masonic teachers and preachers and more. Now, something that did happen for me was shortly after my conversion, not very long, like literally weeks, God revealed that the Trinity was not true. Um, and it, I, I, I was stunned by, by this, just, it, I just knew it. Um, so I mentioned it to my Christian friend. I kind of danced around it a little bit. And I was abruptly told very quickly not to question the mystery. And then what I found was all fellowship along the way afterwards was contingent on Trinity, Triune God, etc. So I did fall into that because I did eventually go to church. Not that I fell into the Trinity, but I fell into the fellowship with people who believed that. It never was a thing for me. Um, but here is the wonderful news. God read me out of the Trinity in his word completely by April of this year, revealing he is one Lord. Jesus is his human Messiah, the Holy Spirit, his power, God's power sent through the risen Christ to believers. With that Trinity idol overcome, after three years of intense solitary study on my own, I am given the go to ministry. So today, my ministry, my website, Clairvoyance to Christ, as Clearly, that was, you know, a big part of my journey. So my ministry to new age, occult, new age occult practitioners is to challenge them to question and examine their beliefs, to encourage an awakening to a movement composed of and rooted in dangerous uh, satanic occult practices, and then share with them that the only way to serve God is through faith in Jesus Christ as he is revealed to us in scripture and bring them the gospel of the kingdom. So many people who are practicing in the new age the way that I did believe they are serving God and they think that they are serving God the creator. Then they it's all skewed and it's very confusing. I dearly hope that they can understand and that is my um, my work in to, to them in my ministry also to believers in Jesus Christ, to help them discern and understand what the new age is and identify new age occult practices happening in the world and in the Christian churches and help believers become informed as to why they should mark, avoid, and call out new age practices in the church. 
and in the lives of other believers that they might know. So question number three then we come to, how can Christians discern what is new age? So one of the things that I found interesting that was that once I began to attend a Christian church, um, my observation was that there seemed to be very little difference between practices going on in the church and practices in the world and in the new age. So the books that were being read for Bible study, instead of actually studying the Bible, I mean, I did attend a few churches where we did actually study the Bible, but some churches were studying Richard Rohr books and and all these, this, this ridiculous stuff that has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. So this is just hopefully a little schematic that you'll be able to kind of put in front of your eyes, um, you know, remember it is what I mean. So basically identifiers of new age are, it's either East and pagan, and this is really clear in scripture <laughs> where we're not to go, or this other element that I was also bringing in humanism and all of that is is idolatry it just all is idolatry worship of the creation replaces worship of the creator it contradicts god and comes between us and god so this focus on east this focus on self and humanism so from scripture ezekiel 8 16 and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about five and 20 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east and they worshiped the sun towards the east. So not new age, Practices that are not showy like Wicca with massive wands and crystals or fortune telling. The new age sneaks into church looking less, quite a bit less threatening and obvious. So it makes it harder to discern for those who are not familiar with what it encompasses. It'll sneak in all kinds of ways, in devotionals, the way devotionals are worded, in prayers to angels, in Christian books that are not Christian at all. An example of that is Richard Rohr, a book called Jesus Calling, even personality tests and things like that. So this is an example of Richard Rohr. Franciscan friar and ecumenical teacher, Father Richard Rohr, bears witness to deep wisdom of Christian mysticism and traditions of action and contemplation. Founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation, Father Richard teaches how God's grace guides us to our birthright as beings made of divine love. And then he's the author of a number of books. If it, there's ever New Age words, that paragraph right there contains a whole bunch of them. So when I'm terming the softer side of the occult, is easier to bring into the church. Um, it looks good. It seems harmless. It appears to be love and light, but it is a lie. Again, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So New Age practices in the church, we're going to go through a few. There's lots, but we're going to go through a few, and I'm going to demonstrate how and why they are a cult. Meditation. Many churches, that's where I began my meditation, my reconnect with meditation back in the 1980s. Lots of churches are stepping into this and have been for quite some time. This is what um, three uh, Psalms in, in scripture say uh, about Christian God-approved meditation. Psalm 1-2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate day and night, reflecting on God's law? Psalms 5, 1. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Now, I love this because there's a component here of words that can be separated. But I'm going to suggest that there's a component there of words that is also about speaking in meditation to God and asking and seeking and, and querying and praying. 
Um, this happens again in Psalms 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So it's important because quieting is so important for new age as a new age tool. So new age meditation involves centering, calming of energies, progressive relaxation techniques, squeezing muscles, letting them go, squeezing muscles, letting them go. Visualization, a lot of guided, uh, a lot of meditation ends up being guided meditation where somebody else, someone outside of you, a voice outside of you is telling you where you are and what you're seeing. And then you are to use your imagination to fill in this visualization key to new age and breathing techniques to become still and calm. So relaxing and centering is the primary tool used by new age occult practitioners. This is being practiced in the church. Meditation, all forms of it, and there are various forms, we won't go into them today, but basically it's sit still, um, breathe, relax, go inside and visual is, is um, it involves three similar occult phenomena, the cultivation of altered states of consciousness, the eventual development of psychic powers. This is why it's a basic foundation for developing occult powers and the possibility of spirit possession. So without hesitation, I say meditation should not be in the church or in the life of a believer for any reason except sticking to Psalms 1, 2, 5, 4, and 19, 14, for our guidance and instruction on meditation and anywhere else in scripture that God tells us, God shows us how we are to meditate. So meditating other than God's way is, there's no other way to put this, experimenting with the occult. Clairvoyance, psychics, mediums, shamans, witches, and occult practitioners use meditation to acquire and develop psychic abilities. Meditation is a new age occult practice, the very nature and goals of which involve the probability of spiritistic, uh, which is demon spirits, involvement. Not possibility on this one, probability. Meditation cannot be Christianized by bringing Jesus into it to try to, for example, I've heard some meditations to try to arouse greater love for him or get him uh, uh, or get closer to Jesus or grow your faith in him. That is not how you do it. It is through scripture. It is through prayer. An occult practice cannot be blended. It cannot be rebranded or relabeled or in any way, shape, or form, Christianized. Another one is yoga. Oh, it was yoga that I learned in the church. I was just talking about meditation. Um, this one is the yoga. So basically the whole point of yoga is that through relaxation, a combination of relaxation and uh, postures, uh, exercises, they look a lot like stretching exercises. They're called asanas. The whole point is to yoke with your higher self while you literally, with these poses, are offering yourself up to Hindu gods. Yoga is crafted to put you in a state of altered consciousness. It's the whole point of yoga. It doesn't matter if you are practicing just the exercises or not. They are not for Christians. You are uh, on your way to uh, an, an altered uh, state of altered consciousness in which you are supposed to be able to realize that you yourself are a god. It's an orthodox system of Hinduism, the religion. And as I just said, even the exercises on their own are not for Christians. These alone, even the exercises, can open you to possible demon possession. 
So how does this happen? Well, this fancy new age explanation is yoga opens one up to the kundalini serpent power to enter in and rise through the central psychic channel up the spine. Yoga is a new age occult practice, the very nature and goals of which involve the probability again of spirituous involvement. Have I gone backwards here? No. No, excuse me, I haven't. So this is exactly the same as meditation. It opens you up. And in addition to which, I think a lot of people think and feel, look, I'm just practicing the stretches. I'm just doing the stretches. Well, I will tell you this has happened to many an innocent yoga enthusiast that they have opened themselves up to possession and become um, under possession of a demon spirit. Part of it is, um, even though you're just doing the stretches, you're still doing what it is that calls the, calls the demons in. And also, uh, inevitably, you're going to want to do more anyway. So what is yoga without some meditation? What is yoga without sitting and visualizing? That sort of thing. Other, I'll call them hard to spot, new age practices that have made their way into the Christian church. The Enneagram tool. This is a very interesting. It's called a tool for personality testing and self-discovery. Now in the back of the, uh, just behind the writing there, you can probably see that nine pointed star. So the Enneagram traces back to ancient times and classical uh, Greece. Um, it's, it's connected with true self and false self and self, self, self. This is when you take this Enneagram test or when people take this Enneagram test. They're figuring out what your true self is and then what your false self is and how that false self tends to, um, uh, you know, trip you up, trip up your true self. I mean, it's really quite something. It's all self, self, self. It's supposed to contain wisdom and divine insight. So this, uh, this thing in the back, this nine-pointed star, is sacred, sacred geometry. It's also a very ancient symbol. Um, it's also the symbol, uh, the primary symbol of the Baha'i faith. Um, it involves triangles and hexagons. Um, so in terms of all this new age and, and connections back to ancient occult, nine as aspects of deity, nine Celtic gods, nine Egyptian gods, nine Greek muses. All of those nines come back to this star. They're represented in that star. And so the question I ask is, have you ever seen the Enneagram endorsed by God in scripture? So again, the nine pointed star is a common mathematical shape that consists of three intersection, uh, three intersecting triangles. And uh, in new, new Age terminology, it's a symbol of spiritual enlightenment and completion. It's also associated with the Hindu, Hindu god of creation, Brahma, who is said to have created the universe in nine days. And Brahma is part of a triple god um, uh, scenario. So clearly, Call it what you want, the Enneagram, the nine-pointed star, and anything to do with it, a personality test or what you will that involves self, false self, true self, is East, pagan, and New Age. They should not be utilized by Christians or offered in the church to help people on their walk with Christ. Another one is the law of attraction. Um, this is this whole idea that you can attract to yourself whatever it is that you want. And you can avoid the things that you don't want by creating, visualizing, seeing what it is you want in your mind's eye. Here we go back to stirring the imagination, stirring visualization, and then allowing Right at the very basic law of attraction is witchcraft and it's magic and not in any way, shape or form should Christians get involved in this practice of the law of attraction. God decides we do not 
And there's no greater fool than we think we can cause these things to happen. Now, some people deftly argue, Christians, I've heard some Christians do this, that it's based on scripture. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Sure. But however, we look at 1 John 5, 14 to 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We know we have to pray in God's will. And we, as believers, strive to do that. And certainly we can ask the Lord for things to help us in our lives, to provide us with certain things, but it needs to be in his will. That's so important. Christians know that. And also this, this thing about law of attraction, you know, it's really about building your life up with things, right? So Matthew 6, 19, 21, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor, nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also with our Father in heaven. That's where we want to lay up our treasure. Also, these various word of faith, name it, claim it, prosperity gospels, these are all things. I don't think anybody has really ever associates these with the new age. They're pure, complete, and pure new age. Hokum bokum, they've been coming in for a long time. Praying to use God to get your goals and plans for your life. It's straight up new age, straight up law of attraction, trying to drag God into the mix. There is a God who will answer your prayers here but it is not God, our Father in heaven. And I'll leave that there. There's also notions of follow your heart and believe in yourself. And so we simply need to go to Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and leave uh, not, lean, I think it should be not, unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Need we say any more? We are to trust in the Lord with all our heart. There's also these uh, uh, classes, these Ignatian spiritual exercises, which I'm to understand have also been adopted in churches that are not uh, uh, Roman Catholic or associated uh, in any way with that, uh, directly, like specifically with that. So these, uh, they're known as soul streams. So here's a quote about that. By engaging with scripture and prayer and with exercises of the imagination called meditations and contemplations, the spiritual exercises help the retreatant to consider who they are for God and who God is for them. God is the same. This is my statement. God is the same for everyone and does not differ from person to person. Yes, our relationship, our blessed relationship with our Father in heaven is a very personal one, but he is the same God for every single person. Meditation and visualization, new age, East paganism. That's what that's all about. Here's another one, uh, another quote. The exercises are good for increasing one's openness to the movement of the spirit for bringing to light hindrances within us that may obstruct one's attunement to the spirit and their truest self. There's one of those true self, truest self, self-humanism, new age. So here's just a pretty quick listing of other New Age practices done in the Christian church. You probably recognize a lot of these. Anything secret sensitive, it is, it is. It compromises scripture, compromises the gospel to bring people in, to get the crowds in. This whole notion 
of all roads lead to heaven. Again, ecumenism, new age. Um, praying to the angels, praying to saints. Uh, anything to do with self-improvement, positive mental attitude, realizing your potential. This is all intricately connected with new age. Anything touted to help you live a more successful Christian life. Only God can, can be a part of your walk and bring you into better step with him. Anything outside of you or a course or some kind of class or devotion that is to help you live a more successful Christian life, I urge you to stay away from it. Uh, healing ministries um, just are teaching prophecy, tongues, or how to develop a gift from God. Only God can do that within us. We don't need somebody else to teach us prophecy. I mean, there are whole ministries built around these things. Um, and then just straight up going quiet and within to listen for God's voice. I know so many people who are full on, bang on, new age practitioners today. That is exactly how their journey started. Going within, quietly, listening for God's voice, hearing a voice, hearing it again, and then eventually being led down the garden path into the new age. God is the giver of all. No new age techniques or teachings needed. They only take you away from God. They incite him to anger and cause him to turn away and to turn you over. Participating in new age practices is spiritual adultery. So now we're on to question four. How do we do battle? with the New Age occult in our church? Well, I like to keep things simple when I can. So I'm calling these the four R's. Believers need to recognize, research, repent, and reprove. So recognize. Basically, something that's either brought to your attention or perhaps going on in your church could be the offering of an Enneagram test. It could be a series of devotions that are, you know, things that I've been, been talking about, examples um, that I've been trying and hoping to put in front of you. Endeavor to see that, that practice or that class or the matter, whatever it might be, for what it is. Endeavor to get clear about it. Make that your goal. And if it is being pointed out to you, and it really doesn't matter who or how, you know, as a believer, that the Holy Spirit will put things in front of you in all kinds of ways. Once this happens for you, recognize that the Holy Spirit is alerting you to it. And then you're going to commit to take further steps with prayer for guidance. God will, with your commitment, your wanting to know through him, God will get you where he wants you to be. You've got to resolve to find out God's truth on the matter. And then to help yourself, it's really important to research, to understand. You want to become informed on the practice or the matter. So um, let's say that there's a, you know, I just a random example. There are a series of devotionals being offered. And based on what you've heard tonight, you go back and you listen, and it's starting to be like, uh oh, that doesn't sound good. I kind of tapped into that information the other night. Okay. So research to learn what you can about it. Listen to the words. Look into, if it happens to involve visuals, the signs, the symbols, what's being said, what's being conveyed, what are you being asked to do, those sorts of things. Also, talk to others who know, who happen to know more about it, to hear what they have to say. So, for example, I'll use myself as an example. I know a lot about the New Age. I can would be happy always to share, to answer questions. You may know other people in your life who, who would, would be able to be that same person for you. But the key thing is do all you can to see it clearly. 
prayerfully with the guidance of Holy Spirit. Um, so my website is meant to be a resource uh, for exactly that sort of thing. I explore and call out New Age practices on my website, clairvoyancetochrist.com. In terms of words, which I put in red up above, I'm going to take you into some examples of symbols in a second here. But there is an A to Z list of New Age words and practices. And there are some articles and videos. I've just begun um, my ministry. So I'm constantly working behind the scenes to build up content to help believers and to help New Age practitioners. So that it's a growing catalog of that information. Um, there's videos with information, articles, and um, other things to help educate and inform. So when I say symbols, I mean these sorts of things. You know, you, you might see a symbol on something. So note it. If, if, you net, if you notice it, note it. So these are some, like the Enneagram is in that top left-hand corner there. You've got Eastern symbols, yin yang. You've got pyramids with all seeing eyes. The red cross is, it's a new age occult symbol. It is, that is not a, 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 anything to do with Christianity, with, with being a believer. Peace signs, pentagrams, uh, uh, multi pointed stars on the right, all kinds. Whenever you see these swirls and things, uh, uh, onks, moons and stars. These are all um, witcha, wicca, witcha, um, goddess worship symbols. So these are things, especially now, like, you know, if you have a blue Honda, you see the blue Hondas. Now that you've seen these, you may notice them. These are symbols that communicate to people who know what they are, basically. Learn what you can. I'm not saying go overboard. Just be able to say, okay, that's a new age symbol and this is why. And again, these are some of them too. You can see chakras, the, the gentleman, black gentleman standing there with the colors going up the spine. You can see meditation. You can see visualization, um, unity with the hands joining together, um, planets uh, for astrology, pointed stars, popes, hats, crystals, yin, yang. These are all symbols that are all over the place in the world. Um, if these it are, are hooked up with things you're looking at, make a note and see what you can learn about it. Then the other R after research is repent, which simply means change your mind about it. Renew your mind in scripture. If you have um, done the other and you've researched, and you've looked at it, and then you know now, okay, this isn't good this is not good, then uh, you can repent. You change your mind about it. Measure, prove, check against scripture. What does God say? This is part of re renewing our minds in scripture. Take the time to search the scriptures for God's truth. Reprove. Review scripture. Um, know how to reprove how it's done by believers. Very important to review that and understand that. See and seize the opportunity that God has put before you on the mission field. The opportunity to inform your church and possibly learn something together as a fellowship, okay? Be prepared to speak. Be prepared with your research, your resources, and scripture. But your church is... Um, uh, hosting or holding or offering uh, meditation classes. This is the mission field. You need to speak. You need to approach in whatever way that, you know, God leads you to do it, to speak about this because it should not be there. That should not be happening in the church. Um, by speaking, by doing these things, you are in God's will and therefore you will be and are in his hands. Do not let the spirit of doubt win. Do not let Satan take control. Be in constant prayer about this. You are dealing with a new age practice in your church and likelihood as you are, it's time to speak about it. We must never be afraid to stand up for what's right and call out the new age in the Christian church. And the reason for that is only harm comes from remaining quiet. We need to know 
that we have to plant seeds of truth, whatever the result. If we are rejected, that's the result. Um, you don't know what's going to happen, but it doesn't matter. It, it's separate and apart from the outcome. We must trust God to do what he will do with those seeds. We cannot know what he's going to do. We just know we have to speak. Being a believer, I like to say, is not a spectator sport. It's not a sit on the sidelines proposition. I don't care who you are, <laughs> where you are in your life. Uh, believers take action. When they know they take action, informing and calling out these practices in love and in kindness, in being informed, in knowing, being prepared with scripture. You're not going into this alone. You are Jesus is there with you, the Word and the Holy Spirit, and you're in your Father's will. 2 Timothy 2, 24, 25, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach patience, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Okay? Anybody who's participating, any believer who's participating in the new age practice is opposing him or herself. Timothy's tell us, step up, um, gently teach, gently point out in meekness, instruct. New age in the churches is serious stuff. We've gone through the history. We know what the end game is as far as Satan is concerned. We know that there is this concerted effort and has been for many years to infiltrate the church and it is happening. It is absolutely happening and has been for some time. If believers are not going to reprove it, who is going to reprove it? We are commanded to warn in Ezekiel 8, 18, which says, when I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die and you do not warn him nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. That's pretty serious stuff. God's saying, if I've told him and you don't, that's not good. Those you warn may not even know that they are involved in evil or that it's a cult. This is so important to even keep in your mind. There may be, there, there likely are. Everybody probably doesn't know. And there may be people who actually God is trying to put you in front of them to open their eyes. Try and look at it that way. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. When you've got your scripture with you, you've got everything you need. We must stand for our Lord and Savior who gave his life blood for our sins. Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The new age is the wiles of the devil. The bar is high for believers. Once we truly know Jesus, we have no excuses. He is our example. The apostles are our example. We are to be of one accord with those we fellowship with. We fellowship with Acts 114. When there is something like this going on in the church, when your pastor is offering or the whatever, or you know, part of the church is offering meditation or a new age practice, this isn't being of one accord. This you need to be brought back into accord. We are to press toward the mark, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We have a job here to do on earth. Believers have no excuses. Um, uh, Philippians, Philippians 3.14, the least we can do is speak out and call out these practices in our church. Philippians 3.16.19, nevertheless, to where we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly uh, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. So all this new age is earthly stuff. These are pretty strong 
strong um, uh, guidances from Paul. Stand for your family, stand for yourself, stand for the children, stand for your church, discern and stand. And I'm hoping I've given you, you know, a good start here on how to recognize these. What are we to do? We're to overcome Revelation 2 and 3 as Christ overcame Revelation 3.21. We are to be ready for Christ's return and not in slumber or be without oil in our lamp, Matthew 25, 1 to 12. We are to watch and keep our garments, Revelation 16, 15. We are to study, to show ourselves approved so we are not ashamed, 2 Timothy 2, 15. We are to watch and pray so that we don't fall into temptation. There's a whole bunch there. Um, the watch and pray, watch, 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 uh, ending there with 1 Peter 4, 7. We are to remember that the return of our Lord could happen at any time, and we are to be ready. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, and we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. If we push back on something that God has put in front of us, and we know that we're supposed to speak, that's grieving the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The new age is Satan's most brilliant way of lulling believers in to sleep. Do not fall for it. Do not tolerate your church falling for it. Matthew 21, 12, 13. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Is your church robbing its people? Please say no. And that is what I've got to share with you tonight. Well, thank you, Claire. That was great. Uh, we could break that down into a lot of different things and have a lot of deeper discussions on those. We sure yeah. could. <laughs> yeah. So a few comments from people watching here. And let's see. Uh, Sharon says, Satan transforming himself into an angel of light, deceiving, if possible, the very elect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. That's what's going on. Um, so Meryl asked, what are your thoughts on breathing and relaxation techniques for pregnant women? Back in the 80s, that was... Uh, it was a big thing to take a group class. <laughs> That's my thought, Meryl. Um, yeah. I wouldn't it's, say there's per se anything. I mean, if you're just taking a, you know, a, a deep breath, you know, in through your nose, sure. out through your mouth, it's not like you're sitting there in a class and everybody's breathing and you're trying to get into some sort of whatever, you know, meditation. Right. Okay. So one of the things to just be really cautious and and cognizant of is that this can lead to other things. That's where mm -hmm. the big, huge caution is. Um, so breathing and relaxing, um, and it feels good, right? So it really worked for this. And boy, oh boy, you know, I had a, hot, a tough pregnancy and the breathing and relaxation really helped then, well, you know, wonder if it would work for this and work for that. So this is, this is the, the hallmark is that it is going to lead to other things. Um, if somebody is doing that with absolute clarity about what could possibly happen and the conviction that they aren't going to go any further, that could be a different thing. Um, I just, I'm extremely cautious because I've seen so much of it and I've experienced so much of it in my own life and with people I know that that I err on the side of, of caution. Well, and like you said, that's where it can lead somewhere else. So if it's in the classroom, if it's in the church you know, or with the young people, it may not initially be the evil where it can go, but you don't know what they're going to go research online and look this up. Oh, this was cool. We did it with the pastor and they think it's OK because it was OK there and then they're deceived going mm -hmm. further down. Yep. So that's where um, you gotta be really careful. 
Um, yeah. Sharon, other Sharon asks us, did you ever look into pyramids and the powers that they have or supposedly have? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a period in my time in the new age when I did quite a bit of looking into the pyramids, pyramids and the whole Egyptian thing and the whole history and all of that. Um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't, you know, in a, you know, I think Sharon, you know, that my, my position in all of this is that it's power is given to, to those who imbue the power to it. Right. And any power that comes through something like that is demonic power. It's demonic mm -hmm. evil spirits that are influencing the whole deal. So yes, I did. And that's one of the reasons why I included that uh, symbol in the, uh, in that page of symbols there, just a quick go by. Um, it is a deep, very ancient occult symbol. And, and, you know, the thing is, you look around, you probably see them all the time, especially if it's something you're asking about, Sharon, but they're all over the place. You see them all over the place. So there's mm -hmm. a ton I could say about that, but I won't, I won't go into it tonight. <laughs> right, right. And Laureen says, wow, wow, wow. Yep. <laughs> people are listening what you're just not aware of you know all well and that's the thing it, it is light it looks how can, so light. it sounds good i was taking yes. some notes that it's not all evil on the outside there you know you're doing good things it's peace personal growth like you've shared in other uh presentations that you thought you were helping people when Absolutely. you were doing what you did and you know just you know it's for health and it sounds christian uh, or they use the word church, or like you said, Messiah. Um, even that one lady who labored or, labeled herself as a Christian, uh, Alice mm -hmm. Bailey. Um, mm -hmm. So just because someone calls themselves a Christian or says it's a church event, um, you need to be careful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I call it love, light, and lies. It's it's right right it's deception uh, yeah. we're not going to keep people on too much longer i did have a couple Understood. comments though myself um so I, I really appreciated one thing you said we need to mark avoid and call out so i mean obviously you do that in love and out of love always but yeah. if, if we're not doing that because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings or what will they think of us you know, maybe we can turn around and walk away from that and not be affected by it. But there's so many people sitting and don't realize that this door is just getting open wider and wider and wider. Yeah. And like you mentioned with the yoga, you may not think you're doing it or games that you play, but you're calling out to the demons to come in. And yeah. just because you're not saying demon come in doesn't mean that door is not open if you're doing things that open those doors. Yeah, that's exactly the design of these things. Um, it is, uh, you know, I also talked about the signs and the, the secret little words and things. Well, that's what you're doing with, mm -hmm. with the demonic realm. You mm -hmm. are participating. You have stepped into another way that I say it is you have stepped out of God's jurisdiction into Satan's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you've left, you've left, you know, the street and stepped into the donut shop and now you're, you know, you got to follow the rules there. Right. 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 I'm, being, I'm being silly, but you get my point. It's, right. it's and just by the very action. Yeah. Yes. And you said that at the beginning that the new age has a task to, has a task and to finish it. They want to finish it. They want to oh, finish yes. it too. So you said that they are clear in their purpose and their goals. So we see mm -hmm. that our, our topic to, you know, this weekend is finish the task. Um, they have a task and they're wanting to finish it and they have clear goals and purpose. So my question is for us, individuals and as ministries or churches, do we have a clear purpose and do we have goals towards finishing the task that we are supposed to have? I don't think we should be left behind in that. I mean, they're out doing it and they've got their purpose and their goals Yeah, and they're clearly working toward it. You know, what are we doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely a question so. that we each, each of us needs to be asking ourselves. And the beautiful thing is that this is part of what I'm hoping will be a takeaway. It's I, not saying it's easy. It's never easy to, to speak on these things. It's hard. <laughs> But 
if God's putting it in front of us, there's a task. That's part of our task then, right? And God is so um, gracious and wonderful in that he does this for us. He puts something right in front of us. And then from there, we get to step in. But of course, we have our, you know, we've got our free will. Um, so our, 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 ta our finishing our task may be just a bunch of little tasks, you know, that, that God is putting before us each and every day to, mm -hmm. to walk Christ in and, and bring in the light. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you to go to Clairvoyance to Christ and check out um, all those interesting articles there. Also the list we put together. Um, as she mentioned earlier, do some research, but you don't have to get so into it that you're getting mm -hmm. drugged down the rabbit hole yourself. Yeah. Uh, but you need to be aware of things. And um, yeah, I thank you for the work that you're doing. We'll end here with a couple uh, thank yous from our dear sisters here. Thank you, Claire, thank from you, Sharon. Sharon. And um, Shelly says, so very blessed to have Claire. Vice Maybe. versa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for all your hard work on this presentation. We're blessed to have you as one of our sisters. That's Nancy. I'm blessed. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Shelly says, yeah. thank you, Lori and Sharon, and she just yeah. is going on and on. Yeah. Um, very eye-opening, and thank you. So oh, I, my, thank you, Lori Jean. Yeah, so I, I thank you as well, um, Claire, and I thank everybody uh, for joining us tonight. And hopefully we'll see you all back here tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Yeah. And our speaker is going to be Dan Gill, uh, speaking to those confused with Kelvin, uh, Kelvin's teachings. Uh, Shelly's mm -hmm. going to be on, our own Shelly, yeah. and she's going to be sharing her testimony and speaking to former Watchtower followers or Jehovah's Witnesses and her experience trying to help those who are still in and how she's tried to uh, be a sort of a lighthouse for those who are waking up and maybe wanting to come out. And our third speaker will be Joe Martin, and he will be sharing about his recent, recent missions trip to Africa. They haven't been over there for quite a while uh, with COVID and everything else going on. And so they were there three months uh, in two different trips uh, this past summer. So that will be fun to take a look at what he has to share. And again, we're going to be having a drawing for this mug on uh, Saturday and Shema and also this Tumblr. So join us. We will have a drawing and you just might be one of the lucky winners there. I put in the uh, chat there uh, the schedule you can find at kogmissions.com online 2023. And when this is all over, you can watch the individual replays there from each of the speakers they will be listed there. So Claire, thanks so much. Do you have a final word as we say goodnight? Gosh, you know, I think I've said quite a bit and I'm so grateful for, for those who stuck around and stayed with it because that's a lot to absorb. Um, thank, thank you, Sharon. Um, uh, just, you know, just um, our, our God is a good God and let's just do what we can when he puts it in front of us. And if I can ever be of any support or answer any questions, I'm happy to do so. Um, and they can find your email address at clairvoyance to Christ.com there. Uh, you know what? I'm going to add that. I don't think I've put that on there, but I'm going right. to do it. Mm -hmm. I will get that on there and I'm always happy to give that to, out to anybody who wants it anyways. So. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Thank you, Claire. And again, thank you to everyone. Have a blessed evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. And we hope yeah. to see you back here tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Eastern. So have a blessed night. Bye-bye.